I'm Commissioner Ty Menser, and today I'm having coffee with Superior Court Judge Schaller, Prosecuting Attorney John Thunheim, uh, Patrick O'Connor, the Director of Public Defense, and Carrie Hennon, our Pretrial Services Director. Thank you for joining me. And today we will be talking about the Thurston County pretrial system. So what does pretrial even mean? Let's start with Judge Schaller. What is pretrial, and what is the kind of legal framework around that, that part of the legal case? Well, pretrial is the time period from someone's first appearance in court until the um, resolution of the case. Normally, the first appearance would be at a preliminary appearance hearing or at an arraignment. And a case can conclude in a variety of ways, including a dismissal, diversion, a plea and sentencing, or the matter could go to trial. The legal principles that apply during this time period are what I think most people are used to hearing. Um, a person charged with a crime is presumed innocent. They have a right to remain silent. They have a right to a lawyer. They have a right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury. And when you talk about what laws apply, uh, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Washington, court rules, statutes, and case law. Um, so that's what pretrial is. Also, when someone is pretrial, normally there is some form of conditions of release or um, things that they are required to do or not do while their case is pending. So that's kind of what pretrial is. And Carrie, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, what does Thurston County's pretrial services department do in the context of what Judge Schaller laid out? Thanks. So uh, two major things that pretrial services does is screening and supervision. So on the screening side, Judge Schaller mentioned the preliminary appearance. So the typical process would be an individual might be arrested, booked into the county jail. At the time of that preliminary appearance, our department, pretrial services, will have provided a screening report to the court and to the prosecuting attorney's office and public defense. That screening report <coughs> is designed to provide consistent, objective information to help the judicial officer make those de decisions Judge Schaller referenced about release, detention, and those conditions of release. So um, we're looking at an individual's criminal history, their history of court appearance, other factors. We are now, as of about a month ago, using a validated pretrial risk assessment tool that is designed to use an algorithm to basically predict someone's likelihood of future court appearance, their likelihood of new criminal activity during that uh, pretrial period. So that really, that's the screening function, again, to provide the judicial officer and the parties with some basic, consistent information in a timely way to inform those discussions at the preliminary appearance. The other piece that pretrial services does during the pretrial period is supervision. So if an individual is released by the court, one of the conditions may include pretrial services supervision. So what our department would do if, uh, if an individual, individual is ordered to our supervision is meet with them, review their conditions of release, and then our department will monitor those conditions. That will include things like monitoring for new criminal law violations during the pretrial period. The individual will be required to report to our office on a certain frequency. If we come to know of a violation of those conditions of release, such as a new arrest in another jurisdiction or not reporting to our office on the required frequency, then we would make the court and the parties aware of that. So during that period, it's sort of, um, Again, monitoring those conditions and letting the court and the parties know whether those conditions are being followed. Great. Well, some of the folks who are out released by the court and on conditions would have posted bail. Some may not have had to post bail, but I'm going to kind of segue and ask the prosecuting attorney, John Thunheim. Um, we've heard about bail reform. It's in the news. It's one of the pretrial topics that we hear about. Can you kind of give folks an overview of what that means and and kind of where that stands in Thurston County. Sure, um, you know, bail reform is really kind of a term that's a subset of criminal justice reform. And it means a little bit different things in different contexts. So, for instance, one context of uh, bail reform might be just reforming the entire pretrial system that we've been talking about in terms of making better decisions about who might um, be uh, held in jail during the time when their trial's pending or who might be released and if they're released, what kind of conditions get put on them and so forth. 
But I think in general context, when people talk about bail reform, most of the time they're talking about the application of money bail. Um, and because in Washington state and in many, many other states throughout the country, one of the conditions that a judge can impose is the requirement that somebody post a certain amount of money to be able to obtain their release. And we commonly refer to that as bail or money bail, or, or they buy a bond from a bail bondsman, right? And so the idea of bail reform is, uh, in that context, is looking more specifically at that condition and how it's used, because often that's the condition that determines whether somebody's going to remain in custody while their trial is pending, or whether they're gonna get out of custody. And what's the, I mean, what are, there's criticism, I think, about the use of over-reliance on money bail, and, and what is that, what is that nature of that criticism? So the, I think the, the real criticism about money bail is that it can kind of unfairly determine who gets in or out of custody pre-trial based on their uh, financial status. So for instance, a uh, real example here in Thurston County, several years ago we had somebody who was arrested for a murder, um, very serious crime. And uh, the, at the preliminary hearing, the judge set very high bail, which I think you would expect in a murder case. And I think it was in the order of $2 million, right? Um, and that's not necessarily uncommon uh, for a case of that nature. Uh, but what we found out was that that individual's family had some substantial wealth and owned property. So they were able to put that property up and um, uh, use it to obtain a bail bond and the person got released even though this is a very serious crime with very high bail. On the other hand, we have people all the time who come in who don't have that kind of resource who might have their bail set at you know, $2,500 or something like that, but they can't post because they don't have the resource. And that's the criticism of money bail is it, it really depends on the person's financial status in terms of whether they get in or stay out. Um, but unfortunately in Washington, that right now is the structure that we have in our pretrial system uh, to, um, uh, you know, to try to incentivize um, this idea that somebody either return to court, answer to court, or not interfere with, uh, with the administration of justice. And kind of underpinning this whole context of pretrial is that the person has not yet been adjudicated as guilty or not guilty yet. That's right. So. As the judge said, you know, people uh, pre-trial, there is a presumption of innocence. And along with that, there's actually a presumption in our framework and our uh, court rules and statutes that actually presume that somebody should be released absent some other compelling reason around public safety or their ability to return, their willingness to return to court, or whether they'll interfere with uh, the administration of justice. So we obviously have a, a wide range of stakeholders that play into and make decisions around the pretrial system. I like to talk a little bit about how the different pieces work together. Um, uh, you know, how does the pretrial system collaboration between the parts of the system work and what you've learned from that collaboration? Um, anyone that likes to pipe up here? Haven't heard from you, Pat. Yeah, sure. Well, I, you know, thank you for having us. This is such an important uh, topic that um, you know, uh, we've all been working on um, for the past um, a little over three and a half years now, specific to uh, the project that uh, Thurston County was awarded. And sort of piggyback on, um, you know, the topic of bail reform, we've been having a lot of conversations about what that means. And I sort of agree with John's point, reformation um, has a lot of meetings to a lot of different people. I think really what we're talking about with this project, our goal is to make improvements on our processes um, specific to bail within the, the, con, uh, the confines of the law. Um, I will say that um, I think each one of us as a stakeholder, we um, represent different interests, but we have a common interest in improving um, the process. So the process that's been described of an individual is arrested, there's a presumption of innocence, there's the legal requirement in Washington that um, an individual shall be released without posting a financial condition unless there are specific facts and circumstances uh, in which a financial condition or money bail um, is legal. But I think throughout this entire process, what we've recognized is 
taking different jurisdictions and other parts of the country that have studied the same issues and tried to make the same type of bail improvements because we all want to make the best decisions possible. And when we use a financial condition that we're using financial conditions um, on the right individuals based on the law and that we're being um, sensitive to all the things that uh, we've learned throughout this entire process, which are some very core principles about the use of financial conditions and their effectiveness. So I'll let everyone else chime in, but. Anything else about the kind of the way the system works together? Well, I, I think um, uh, one of the ways I see the system working together is kind of coming around some uh, basic core uh, goals, if you will, for pretrial, and that is to, um, you know, really look at the system, and it turns out that there are there are steps that we can take that any justice system can take to uh, make sure that the people who can be safely released to the community while their trial is pending actually get released, and there are steps that we can take to uh, help ensure that they do in fact come back to court and that they you know uh, comply with the conditions that the judge set. And one of those is, for instance, the creation and establishment of a robust pretrial services department, which we're fortunate to have in this county. But those are things that the system can come around and embrace as a whole, right? Those are not, those are not ideals that, that Patrick as the public defender and I as the prosecutor that we debate. We agree on those ideas. And then we come together to figure out what are those steps that we can take and how can we make our system better? We didn't always have a pretrial services department, right? It's, I think it's, it's six or seven years old. Or? It, it has been. It's evolved over the years. It used to be actually just a, a little uh, department within the court itself, right? And only in the last six or seven years, as you pointed out, did it become its own department and with its own funding source and uh, has become much more um, robust. One of the projects that I know all the stakeholders collaborated on, um, and Carrie kind of alluded to this validated tool, and I want to talk more about that. Our county has been participating in, in advancing pretrial policy and research, or APPR project. And maybe I'll ask Judge Schaller to talk. I know you were, you were there from the get-go. Um, could you talk a little bit more about this project and you know, how, it, how it evolved, and then what it will mean to the work that you, that you do on the bench? Absolutely, but first I just want to loop back on the collaboration yeah. piece that um, John and Patrick were just talking about. I think we're really fortunate here in Thurston County because everyone is dedicated to improving our system, whether it's the criminal justice system or our civil system. Really, we're always looking at how we can do things better. And you can have people who have completely diverse um, positions come together with the common goal of improvement. So, you know, obviously the courts perspective where separate branch of government is different than prosecution and defense, um, but we have the common goal really of um, looking at what could be different and we respect each other and we respect each other's um, place. And I, that doesn't happen everywhere and I just think it's so important that respect piece that we have for each other and each role that we have as we have these discussions. Now, On that point, I would just sit, throw out there that I came as a, as a public defender from the state of Alaska and uh, most recently in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is a community not all that dissimilarly sized from Thurston County. And there was nowhere near the level of collaboration and stakeholder work together on solving criminal justice system problems that we have in Thurston County. So I'm very proud of that as a commissioner here. But go ahead. Let's hear about APPR. <laughs> well, I think we're proud of it, it yeah. too, um, the work that we do. Um, so we have been a part of the Advancing Pretrial Policy and um, Research Project, applied for it probably at the end of 2018. Pretrial Services applied for this technical assistance. We started in 2019, at the end of July. And since August of 2019, we um, formed an advisory committee to work on pretrial improvement. We've met monthly for two hours since that time through COVID, that doesn't include all of the committee time, um, subcommittee time that we have um, on this project as well. We really are looking specifically at improving our pretrial process. And part of this project includes um, using, being trained on and using a public safety assessment, which Carrie was talking about. And that just launched 
um, in October. So we're only about a month into it. Um, and really what we're trying to do um, as part of this project is to ensure that we have a more equitable, fair, and transparent pretrial process um, that the people who come through our system, um, that they can understand it and that the public understands as well. Um, and it's a big project and we're not done. We did create a mission statement related to the work in this project and it was really to enhance public safety while simultaneously maximizing court appearance and pretrial release because as John said, the presumption, the law says that we are to presume that people will be um, released and really only establish conditions, including money bail, um, if we find that someone likely won't appear or if someone would likely commit um, a violent offense or interfere with the administration of justice. Okay, well, <laughs> during that process, and it's been several years, has there been an aha moment that that uh, maybe you look to you, Carrie or Pat, um, something that you know you that during this APPR process that was kind of a revelation or something that really stood out for you? Well, I'll go first. I mean, I, there are several um, for me personally, and probably as a team. So everyone, I'm sure, can speak to an aha moment. Um, you know, being a career public defender here in Thurston County, uh, my first aha moment was. Um, you know, when we received the grant, we got exposure to several jurisdictions around the country and a team of experts that uh, specifically does this work. And my first aha moment was everybody around the country is making data-driven decisions on this very issue. And my first aha moment was we've never, like most jurisdictions, I should say, re never really collected data on, um, on this particular part of the pretrial justice system. In other words, we couldn't tell you prior to this project how many times we used money bail or a financial condition, what the average amount was, whether or not, uh, what our, our release rate was, all these sort of key factors, what our failure to appear for court rates were, all these cornerstone uh, pieces to this part of the pretrial justice system. Again, um, like most jurisdictions, we just didn't collect the data. And so my first aha moment was not only A, were we not doing a great job of collecting the data, B, the incredible importance of collecting this data to determine where there are rooms, for, where there is room for improvement or um, maybe what's not working well or some gaps resource-wise, gaps that we may need to invest in to uh, continue to achieve the mission that um, Judge Schaller just stated. So that was a, certainly an aha moment for me. Um, and I think maybe as a justice system, we all took a step back and, and have realized the importance of um, having data throughout the entire criminal justice system, which I would say probably historically hasn't done as great a job in a variety of areas, but particular to this is now we're, now we're collecting that data. Now we can analyze the data because we need to be making data-driven decisions on our practices. and. Um, so one aha moment was we need more data and this project has put us in a position to collect that data. So I completely agree with the importance of data. I'd say I have a little bit of a different aha moment. I came to this work more recently than Patrick or my other colleagues and really came out of a social service background, behavioral health background. I think a lot of the aha moment to me is how similar the challenges and barriers in the pre-trial phase through the kind of law and justice system are to the issues that we see in that social service system, behavioral health system. So I think we know from national data that most people are successful during the pre-trial period. Most people do return to court. Most people do remain arrest free. And a lot of that national research suge suggests that the barriers to returning to court, for example, are things like childcare, transportation, unmet needs, unmet resources. So it's really sort of linking these two worlds. One, day, one way our county's doing that, as you know, and through our pretrial services department is our resource hub so we can refer individuals who might be ordered to pretrial services supervision and might face some of those barriers to our resource hub where they could connect with local providers on issues like childcare, housing, treatment, et cetera. So um, it really is, you know, I think the aha for me was how how most people, again, are successful during this period and how I think we could increase that success rate by focusing on those underlying needs and trying to connect people where, where appropriate. 
I believe we have another uh, edition of Coffee with the Commissioner about the Resource Hub. So <laughs> for more information, uh, check one of those videos. And so it sounds like that that is uh, something that connects to the pretrial mm -hmm. system as well as folks coming out of incarceration. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Very good. So I'd like to wrap up with maybe a question about ch you know challenges we still face um, you know as pretrial leaders in our pretrial system. Um, what are some of the challenges that you see ahead that we'll be working on over the coming years? Maybe I'll look to Judge Schaller or or Mr. Thunheim. Well, I think one of the challenges is um, just making sure that our community understands what we're doing. Um, and really communicating what pretrial is, just what we're doing today, frankly, just educating people about our system and our pretrial justice system in particular, and um, the rules that we operate under, but the steps that we are taking, as I talked about earlier, the steps that we are taking to really make sure that we are, as our mission statement talks about, um, maximizing release and maximizing return for court, but at the same time also addressing and maximizing public safety. Um, and and there, are, uh, there are challenges to that because there are, I think sometimes people want to jump from the point where if somebody's arrested, then they should be in jail, right? Um, but that jumps ahead in our system. It, it's not honoring that idea that people are presumed innocent until they're proven guilty and that they're also presumed to be entitled to be released until their guilt is established or not. And so we're really we're working really hard now to, um, to, to try to um, reach out to our community and help everybody understand what we're doing. But it's a challenge. I would agree with um, what John just said. I do think that trying to educate um, the people in Thurston County about what we're doing and what we're hoping to accomplish is a really important piece from the court's perspective. For example, we've heard, oh, you're using a public safety assessment. You know, that's a tool. Is that telling you what you should do when it's just one piece of information that comes to the court when we are establishing conditions of release? It's evidence-based, so that's new. We have something that's evidence-based to specifically tell us and be predictive on appearance uh, at court and likely to uh, commit a, a new criminal offense. And so having an evidence-based tool is new, but we've always heard from the state um, on conditions of release and we continue to do that. We always hear from defense, we hear from alleged victims, we hear from pretrial services. Um, and so that is um, unchanged and so we just want to make sure that the public understands that just because we are implementing a public safety assessment, that doesn't mean that that somehow dictates what the court is um, going to be doing. And this is a great way to talk about a really important topic and give information to people. And when you use the term evidence-based, my understanding is that would mean that the, there's the factors that go into the tool have been studied to actually be correlated to or predictive of the, the thing that you're trying to, to use the tool to do. That is correct, and so it was um, validated um, on a more national scale, but then when the project came here to Thurston County, it has been validated within Thurston County on Thurston County data. We used 2017 and 2018 data for cases that had already come through the system, um, and the tool was applied, and it was predictive as it had been on a national scale. Some of these terminology are a little bit terms of art, so I just wanted to go cut through that. Well, this has been an awesome conversation. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, for everyone watching, if you want to keep up with your local government, um, subscribe to the county's YouTube channel. You can watch the Board of County Commissioners meetings there and almost everything we do, including shows like this.